From Chicago's CAN TV, a look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. Well, hello again and welcome to Chicago Newsroom. I'm Ken Davis. Glad to have you with us today here on CAN TV and all those other places where the program appears. Today on the show, a couple of serious questions for some serious panelists. Is this really pretty much the beginning of the end of our culture and our nation as we know it, uh, particularly our city? Uh, we know that uh, Dear Leader has left us and that there's probably no chance that we'll be able to survive the next few years. Um, there's also a possibility with this uh, foreign-born socialist president that uh, he's going to march us all off to work camps. And, Is this uh, the Glenn Beck show? Yeah, and, well, that, that's, that's, that's where I saw that. I thought Glenn Beck told us that. <laughs> so we decided that to help us sort this out, we needed wisdom. And we have, we have convened for the first time our Chicago Newsroom Council of Elders, uh, who, <laughs> and, and they're here with us today two truly distinguished people from Chicago journalism, Dan Miller and John McCarran, uh, both people who have, have absolutely distinguished themselves. Dan at uh, Cranes and business editor Chicago, uh, Chicago Sun-Times, John with the Tribune for many years, and uh, well, you know, this, we'll, we'll talk about all those things you've done as, as we break through. But, <laughs> um, you were brought here today not because of what you were, but because of what you are, people who have some clear thinking about <laughs> things, we would like <laughs> to believe. <laughs> so I don't even know where to begin. Are we really, uh, well, tell, me, tell me this, what's been, on your new, what's been on your mind this last week as you've been watching the news? John, you start just arbitrarily. What, what's the thing that's been really uh, sort of tickling you the most? The big story today, the big story this week, the big story this year, the big story last year, in my view, is the foreclosure crisis and what's that doing to neighborhoods, block after block, two and three uh, vacant bank-owned houses. Now, the, the, the news in this morning's paper where there, there's 60,000 new filings regionally, six-county region, in just, the, in just the first three, uh, three quarters of, of this year. The heavy stuff is coming in my neighborhood in West Ridge. That's got the heaviest uh, number of foreclosures, but that's also the area where people were buying loans, uh, buying mortgages, getting mortgages that they couldn't afford. Mm -hmm. So it's not surprising that the foreclosure rate is rising in that same neighborhood. Also the neighborhood, here we're, we're gonna go with the libertarian versus liberal <laughs> stuff already, but it's also the neighborhoods where the banks were selling neighborhoods right. that some broker probably knew that people couldn't afford, but they needed those loans in order to repackage them and fees, fees, fees all the way up the line. Well, this raises a very interesting question about our beloved sheriff, Tom Dart, mm. uh, and uh, arguably, possibly next mayor of Chicago, who, it seems to me, kind of, is it possible that he kind of uh, misfired a little bit with this thing the other day, saying that uh, he's, he's going to do a round two of not, uh, for, not, not carrying out foreclosures until he's convinced that the banks have done this correctly? It, this, is, this is a little bit different than the first time he did it, isn't it? Well, the first time he did it, uh, he earned an awful lot of credit with the African American community, did. which is one reason why he is—he's got any uh, credibility right now as he ponders a run for mayor. Mm -hmm. But the second time, Ken, the time that he's doing it now, he's—he is interfering with the clearing out of this market, and he's just delaying the pain, and he's just delaying the recovery of the housing market in Chicago, especially in my neighborhood. You, you've just got to clear out this stuff, get it out of the way, get it off the books, take the charges against your earnings if you got any left or close the banks and get on with it. This is, it, it just is bad economics, it's bad public policy too. Well, that sounds cold. I, it's <laughs> that cold. That sounds really cold. There, Ken, there are people who are going to be going into foreclosure if, unless uh, that market can be cleaned out. I, it's, it's just going to continue to cascade unless you can clear it up. It will continue to cascade, there's no, there's no doubt about that. A, a, as to whether uh, Tom Dart was was, as to whether it was a political move, I, you know, I really can't say he's demanding a letter from uh, mm -hmm. at least three major banks saying that our foreclosure documentation is in order. From the chief executives, I mean, uh, clearly that's... Mm -hmm. uh, well, we, we certainly, certainly shouldn't bother the chief executives <laughs> because their time is, is so valuable. 
No, I, I mean, and, and, and the reason I, p I picked foreclosure, well, we, he couldn't we, we've go got to the, get the Dan story, too. He, he but couldn't go to the automatic machines that were signing yeah, the documents the, otherwise. The so. reason I picked foreclosure is because I think it, it, with the presidential election coming up, I, I think the biggest failure of the Obama administration was in health care or his social comment, et cetera, et cetera. It was his inability to, to pursue the causes of the foreclosure crisis mm -hmm. and to lay the blame mm -hmm where the blame belongs and to keep that top of mind in his first two years in office. Instead, he tried to do this organizer thing of bringing us all together and we can talk about and, and the Republicans weren't playing that game. So so to me, I mean, it's it's not only the biggest story block by block in the neighborhoods of, of the city and now creeping out to the suburbs, galloping out and to the suburbs, galloping. but it's also but it's also, I think, the biggest political story in the country and and for for uh, uh, number three, three strikes and you're out. It's also probably the most underreported story I think in America today, journalistically. The um, the uh, the TARP program, T Troubled Asset Relief Program, that was under Bush, of course, and that was meant to go out there and suck up the troubled assets. Instead, it turns into the first round of stimulus, followed by the second round of stimulus, and now we've got the Fed talking about a third round of stimulus that we'll find out the day after the election. That I. You know, how much bad money can you throw after a problem? Well, I mean, the, the, the TARP thing had to be done. The problem with... But it wasn't uh, done as the, it was supposed well, to it be Well, it it wasn't because it, there were no strings attached and it allowed the banks to take the money and play long-term interest rates against short-term interest rates. Mm -hmm. So it, and it hasn't resulted in more money being lent to this, you know, the no, businesses. No, no, there's that, plenty of reasons You know, here's the thing that, that maybe, maybe finally I'm going to get an answer for this because I've wondered about this from day one. If the money, if, if the if the United States government has a lot of money to slosh around, then you can decide whether that's good or not. If they're going to throw money at a problem, why didn't they throw money at specifically at the troubled assets of all of these mortgages and say we're going to help you either buy these mortgages out, we're going to help you reduce the, the the notes on these mortgages? I mean, it seems to me that. Moral arguments aside about whether people should or should not have gotten into these bad mm -hmm. mortgages, the best thing for the country would have been to have helped to get them out of them. I Why think, didn't we do that? I think there were two reasons. One is that it goes against the ideological makeup of the Obama administration. To buy assets from a bank and take them off the hook is just anathema to those people, but I think. But they did that with Wall Street. Well, eventually, yeah, after they saw Lehman Brothers go down and then they had no, no other choice. They panicked. There, there was very little planning going on here. It was just, let's throw money here, let's throw money there, let's uh, buy cash for clunkers and ruin the used car market, let's throw money over here and ruin that market. That was one reason. But the second reason why they didn't do it is that they didn't know how. They simply wouldn't consult with anybody except the people in the White House. That, that White House, and I think, John, even your people agree, it has become the most insular, the most ingrained, the most arrogant, and they simply don't talk to anybody outside, least of all the people who cause the problems. Do your the people agree with well, that? Well, whatever you do, Dan, whatever your people, who don't, are your do, people, don't do what Mrs. Clarence Thomas did <laughs> and, and go on a rant like that on, <laughs> on, on somebody's uh, 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 phone mail because oh, yeah. it'll be, that, it'll yeah. be yeah. Nobody, that is nobody's big story, yeah, John. Captured so. by the mainstream media. <laughs> it's, it's one thing to say it on our show, but for God's sake, don't put it <laughs> don't in the voice mail. <laughs> well, all right, so we, we haven't resolved the, uh, the um, foreclosure crisis, but, no. but I, I think we're all in agreement that it is a major issue and something that isn't going to go away anytime soon. Dan, do you have something else you want to put on yeah, the table? Yeah, what, what's been on my mind, John and, and Ken, is is the mayoral race and who is is going to or what what uh, voting blocks are going to unite behind a given candidate. We know that the African American. Can I just interrupt for one yeah. second? We get we've taken our share of criticism on the show here for jumping the gun and talking about the mayoral race when there are these vital statewide races and county oh, races that yeah. have to be paid attention to beforehand. Legitimate. Uh, to which, after watching several of the debates in the last few days, I kind of say, ah, screw it, let's get on with the marriage. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of been my <laughs> attitude, I have to tell you. That's a poli-sci term. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's, it, how many times can we watch these, the, in, in the, in the governor's right. race and the, and the Senate race, watch these same four guys just read their talking points over and over and over again. Yeah. And, and then sit here 
seriously and with the cameras rolling, trying to trying to analyze these races when there's almost nothing in them to be analyzed. It's, well, there's some, there are some underlying issues. Not that oh, they're sure, talking about sure. the For instance, yes. does, does the state need a tax increase? Mm -hmm. I mean, the Tribune editorial right. board and, and Dan, I'm sure, and and the uh, you know the, the Republican the Republican uh, candidate for governor says no, and and uh, Pat Quinn uh, says says yes. Uh, so, I'm, so there's a real issue, yeah. but rather than rather than go in go into the fiscal techniques of how that would work and where the burden would go and who mm -hmm. would benefit and who would be mm -hmm. the loser, instead we're so and so falsified his military right, record right, and right, uh, right. the other guy is against uh, uh, um, abortions in cases of rape and incest. Well, it's been it's been interesting, and Dan, I, I, we're not we're not deferring your no, your I, thing. Right I, I it's that. just been very interesting to to follow. I know many have been doing it, but I think Eric uh, Zorn at the Tribune has been doing a very good job of sort of hammering this point about, for God's sake. Look at the budget. When you look at the budget, half of it is off the table already because it's fixed costs, and and then you get down to this and this and this, and you end up with possibly a billion, billion and a half that you really have the uh, the flexibility with, and and to just do this nonsensical kind of dime on the dollar thing just doesn't. It, it's just not. It's not fiscally possible. Mm -hmm. you, do you agree mm -hmm. with that? I do, but uh, I think Eric makes the mistake of thinking that this is or could be solved within 12 or 16 months, and it can. Mm -hmm. If you look at the uh, Civic Committee of the Commercial Club proposal on pension reform, you can see there is a way out of this mess without raising taxes right now. But Pat Quinn, and this is where the, where the problem comes in, Quinn's, Quinn's default mode is raise taxes, and Brady's default mode is no, we're not going to. And mm -hmm. that's where the, the, the conversation stops. Then they get into the things that John was talking about mm -hmm. that are basically right, right, irrelevant. Right. Um, but there is a way to get out of this thing. It just can't be done in 16 months. So people who say, oh, you're, you're, you're uh, as you indicated, Ken, um, you're just not being realistic. You can't get out of this without raising taxes. That may be, but it's down the road, and that certainly well, isn't the first solution. I didn't say, I didn't say that no. at all. I just said it's not realistic to believe that you can balance this budget by just saying you're going to do it a dime on the dollar because mm. you're going to have to wipe out. Oh, you mean the 10% cut? I see. The 10% see. Thing, see. yeah. You're going to have to just simply wipe yeah. out entire operations of the state government, which that wouldn't be many bad. might say. I could, I, you want my list? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would like your list, Dan. Department because, of Economic Development, right there. They gave $3 the million dollars to Groupon. $3 million to a company that is the fastest growing company ever in the world to reach a billion dollars in sales? And they need money? Oh, come on. I that, Corporate welfare. What about that? That struck me as a little odd too. I just have to <laughs> well, say. Well, if odd. I were king, if I were king, <laughs> yeah. you would have no states or municipalities competing for businesses by offering them tax breaks. Yeah. I mean, to me, that's just yeah. a madness. Well, this was I mean, the that state, though, be, John. This was that the should city. be done on a federal level. If you're willing to remain in a central city, mm -hmm. you know, you get some kind of break. See, but you yeah, shouldn't. Yeah. You shouldn't set up a situ situation where Chicago is competing against Indiana, and Illinois is competing or against oh, yeah, suburbs. No, you <laughs> definitely should have that kind of competition, John, because that's the way the country is formulated. It is made up of states, and a state with a good business climate, like Indiana, flourishes because they've got a, a, a enlightened leadership. Our our state fails because over the years we've had corruption and people who can't figure out what a, a positive business climate is. Well, our, our state is uh, failing in terms of its public fiscal policy. No question about yeah. that. Jim Farrell of Illinois Tool Works yeah. was quoted the other day as saying you'd have to be crazy to start or expand a, yeah. a business in Illinois right now That's until we get this thing straight. Mitch no, Daniels at Indiana has bills. now put that on a banner yeah. over Welcome to Indiana with Jim Farrell. But one Governor of the Quinn last night was talking about how we're so much healthier than Indiana that companies are coming from Indiana oh. to <laughs> Illinois. Who? Who? That's ridiculous. Nobody. I'm not, I'm not sure he mentioned <laughs> names. I can't remember. But all right. Well, anyway, Dan Miller. Yes, sir. You, you were you were bringing up the uh, there's <clears throat> there's some kind of a mayoral race. There is some kind of a mayoral race, yeah. and it's uh, going to occur in February. It's a nonpartisan race, so everybody is going to run, and anybody who gets 51 percent is or 50 percent plus one is going to be the mayor. That. If, if nobody does, they're going to do it again a little bit later. My thought, though, Ken, is just where are people lining up? Where's the business community lining up? Well, that raises the question, is there a business community? And I think we all agree there isn't. That's why we brought you here, because you're both people who've, who've spent a career writing about Chicago and business and economics. And that's always that's yeah. been a question for me. It's like we there's there's this shorthand thing which we've seen in the paper a million times since Daly made his announcement. The business community oh, yeah. is in crisis because he was their guy, and the business community will never recover from the loss of Rick <laughs> Daly. To which I say, 
what business community? What community is that? Or should we say community? It's, uh, you know, it, it, I don't, I don't understand what a business community is in Chicago. Is there one voice? No, and who no, speaks there isn't. For it if there it isn't. Is? There, there's uh, people in manufacturing which have an entirely different agenda, entirely different needs from people who are in the service sector. There, there is no business community, and they're not united. What, what I've been looking at though is. Who are the people who are supporting different candidates? For instance, the African American, the, the Black Caucus in the City Council. They've been meeting a couple of weeks or a week ago. They were meeting daily to try to figure out meeting every day. They were meeting every day to figure out what candidate can we get behind. Ricky Hendon is in the paper, and he says we're going to get our ass kicked if we don't unite behind someone. What I mean, that mentality is is siege mentality. So you've got that. Then all of a sudden, Melody Hobson president of Aerial Capital Management, which is owned by John Rogers, two premier African Americans. If there is a, if there is an elite of the business community, those people are there, black or white. She is supporting and raising money for Rahm Emanuel. That to me, it seems, would suck all the money, all the energy out of a black caucus effort. Meanwhile, and, uh, and uh, uh, J.B. Pritzker is, is uh, backing Tom Dart. Now, J.B. doesn't live in Chicago. He lives, he, he lives uh, up north, but he's got a major interest here. He's a first-rate venture capitalist. He's probably invested more in Chicago than 90% than of the people who live here. He's looking for Tom Dart. So there's, there's a lot of thinking going on. I don't know where it's going to end up. Well, the business community doesn't speak as one, that's no. for sure, but uh, there is a business community, and we use community pretty loosely in, mm -hmm. in our world, and mm -hmm. uh, like we, we use change, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but if, if, uh, if you'd like to meet them, we'll go over to the <laughs> Chicago Club for lunch, and, oh. and uh, I, I mean, I learned there was a business community when, uh, it, when I was on the Tribune editorial board, and, and whenever a CEO from one of these companies, the, 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 the fortunate 20 or 30, yeah. uh, would, would time to leave, the, the, the uh, editor would go and follow him to the elevator and push the down button, make sure he made it down to the lobby okay in the Tribune time. So there is, uh, you know, Commonwealth uh, Edison or Exelon, and, and uh, you know, there is a business community. There Andy is. McKenna and McDonald's and whatnot. But is it homogeneous, John? Do they it's all? No, no, no you, and you correctly say, I mean, you've got your, the wild men on the, on the board of uh, trade or the, the, the Merck you know, who are very, very much of a libertarian Good point. Uh, Good point. bent. And then you have the, the, uh, the utility uh, faction, utilities and railroads, which are a little, you know, a little more steady. They like to see continuity. And they like stability. St absolutely. And, and uh, if you don't see a lot of uh, business people throwing their, their, uh, their money and their endorsements around, it's because they, they really don't know mm -hmm. which horse to, to back at this point. But the one person I think that they all should probably be uh, consulting with there is Eddie Burke, uh, the chairman of the Finance Committee, who I believe has said he's, that his hat is not in the ring right. to, uh, to run, although I think he'd accept a draft if that <laughs> were possible. Uh, but you know, Ed, Ed Burke is going to be there uh, running the key committee f as far as business is concerned, um, uh, no matter who yeah. the next mayor is. And, and uh, not only does he know where all the bodies are buried, he, he he buried <laughs> most of them, right? <laughs> and interestingly, John, and as you know, the city council, we have a, a strong city council form of government. The mayor sure. of, of Chicago basically is weak relative right. to mayors in right. other cities. But I think quite possibly, I mean, if I were handicapping this thing today, I, I would say in, in your Feb, no one's going to get 51% in February. Right. So you're, right. you're in a city that's one third, one third, one third, I think you're going to end up with uh, a black candidate in the April runoff running against a white slash Hispanic candidate. And we can we can play games about who those two people will be. Um, I think there'll be more than one African American candidate. I think there probably will be more than one Hispanic. Ch uh, Jerry Chico is. No, I'm talking it. about the April runoff between the oh, top oh, two. Oh, I see. You're right. I think you're right there. The two with the, with the pluralities. Uh, yeah. And the next thing is that that person, whoever is unlucky enough to be elected mayor, is going to be there only for four years because the city's problems are so enormous. He is going to annoy and alienate huge blocks of people. He couldn't possibly be reelected the second time. And I don't even think the next mayor beyond that is going to be reelected because that problem is going to swing back the other way and he'll have to try to undo the damage because he's going to be running on yeah. a platform. Well, we're right. seeing that all over except for Indiana. Indiana's uh, where it, throw the bums out, throw the bums out mentality. Are, are you saying are you, are you saying Mr. Miller that that Mayor Richard M. Daley has left such a horrendous mess that it's going to take two terms to fix it up? I, I wouldn't characterize it that way, uh, Ken, but I would say that the problems that the city faces are so bad that it's going to take two terms for two different mayors to clean up. 
So it'll be eight years before we get to, as John indicated, continuity, predictability. And that really is what, what the business community, if it exists, wants, whether you're talking about the traders on LaSalle Street or John Rowe over at Exelon. They want to know what's going to happen, what's the tax policy, what, you know, how are our race relations, everything is race in Chicago, of course. That's what they want. Hmm. Well, this is this is um, disturbing news that you're that you're giving me. Did you buy this thing that we're that we're in for a period of kind of rough sledding? Uh, yes, maybe not for the same reasons. And then I get back to my my hobby horse of the foreclosure problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the city really hasn't yeah. come. No one has come to grips with the enormity yeah. of what's going on out there on the streets. And I be, I am a freelancer, and I I write about for, the foreclosure issue for various uh, groups that are trying to do something uh, about it and and uh, rehabilitate the bank-owned properties and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, it's you know it's just spreading like uh, cancer <laughs> out there with no let up in sight. Uh, and that that gets to the tax affordable, base. Affordable housing. Yeah, it gets one. to the tax base. It gets to you know it gets to uh, employment. It's just it's just very corrosive, undermining thing that's going on. So no matter who's mayor, they they don't have any leverage yeah. uh, and, over and that. And they don't have any money. They We're don't have any money. We're six hundred uh, six hundred well, million in the hole. John, Although John, you know that is yeah. not that's not a, a deficit that's on that's comparable no. to the state. Uh, right. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, as I look at this thing, at first I thought, oh my gosh, he's selling assets. What a terrible thing to do to sell assets to, to uh, pay your bills. But look at it this way. If the alternative is don't uh, sell assets, but instead raise property taxes, make it less likely that people are going to locate their businesses or continue in business in Chicago, mm -hmm. doesn't it make sense then? Yes, don't cause a problem that can't be fixed for years and years and years because if taxes are high, they're going to stay there. Yeah. Sell the asset, hope that the money comes in and we can get out of this. I, I, I would agree with Do that. You? I, and, and it's good to see consistency because libertarians like that are always, uh, <laughs> they always said privatization was the way to go and it's yeah. disturbing that some yeah. of them are now criticizing the mayor. Just I think wondering. Uh, the uh, the parking meter uh, deal was undervalued, yeah. and, and and the process wasn't so great. It was it was rammed through, uh, but it was actually a pretty good idea. And I, and these people who are whining about about having to run their credit card and put the slip no, in their windshield. It is the greatest thing in the world. It's, it I mean, really, there's parking places everywhere downtown now there because are. it's it's tie, tied to the value of the space. You don't have to give some guy with a wine bottle in the alley, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, a pocket full of change to go feed the meter while you're at, at work. It's uh, it's a good idea. Yeah, I Should he have used uh, the proceeds to, uh, to patch the operating uh, deficit uh, this year? Well, he really, as Dan said, he had no choice. It was either that or go to the property tax. But that is that is just an example of something that I think sticks in many Chicagoans craw. It's, it's been very interesting to me among my own friends to note that the initial resistance to this whole thing has worn down as you have found that, I think you're right, this is capitalism at its best, mm -hmm. that, that these parking spaces had value and that value was not 25 cents. Yeah. It was considerably yeah. more than that. And you can talk all you want about the difficulty that obviously many people have paying it, but the fact of the matter is that in one fell swoop, parking was was raised to its sort of intrinsic level yeah, of value. Market level. And it also became easier to do. You can stick your credit card in there and it's done and, it, and it's over. But I think the thing that no one has gotten over is that every time you do that, you're sending that money to a private company that really is not benefiting me as a citizen in any way at all. That money is just being vacuumed out of there by a private company that got a really good sweetheart deal. I think, well, the answer is, is get a better deal. Uh, yeah, and, you know, we haven't even really discussed the, the worst parts of the deal. Where you know, every time, every time the city wants to repair a street, and and therefore blocks access to a, a, a parking space on the curb, they owe, you know, they have to indemnify the uh, the, the 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 lessor, mm -hmm. uh, the the, the uh, Australian right. and Spanish company. That, <laughs> that right. But and, let me just say one: the fact is, Ken, that this company is providing benefits because under the old system, it was difficult to find a place to park. Under the new system, there is a benefit there. In other words, there are parking places. Uh, this, the machines work now. Uh, yeah, but I, I like feel it. like I own that. I, I, as a citizen of Chicago, own that parking space. I'm willing to rent that parking space from my municipal government, but I don't want to rent that parking space from a private company. Huh. Huh. 
Huh. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I know Very that, socialist I, attitude yeah, of yours, yeah, uh, Ken. The socialism is just <laughs> creeping out of us. I'm nervous already. agreeing with Dan here on this one. Uh, <laughs> you're not are. one of these guys that shovel. You, you think you put down. your kitchen, your old kitchen chair out there on the, the curb. No, 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 no. That's, that's, I don't know what that is. That's not <laughs> socialism or, or, I don't know what it's that is. It's peculiar to Chicago. I that's, just, that's just downright selfishness. Territorial uh, integrity. Yeah, that's what it is. But 273 million dollars were taken from from uh, the Chicago Skyway this time also. So as I understand it from the most recent thing I saw, uh, 76 million uh, remains in the 75 year parking lease and uh, about 500 million left in the 99 year Skyway deal. So I mean th those two things are pretty much, it's pretty much gone. And that's not a bad thing because now attention turns to the big honeypot the tax increment financing mm -hmm. pot, right, which right. ought to be sucked out, drained, and that money ought to be used. Not and what? true. Really? No. Really, John? I, See, no. now, you, now you spent a lot of time when you left the Tribune, and we're almost, I can't believe we're almost out of time. When you left the Tribune, you went to Metropolitan Planning Council, so you've kind of been on both sides of this thing. What do you, oh, what? I've always been a fan of tax increment financing. I, I mean, hmm. ever ever since uh, the federal government got out of uh, you know uh, local revenue sharing, you remember that? I you remember do. block grants? You remember the uh, yeah? Uh, that's block grants have been cut way back. There was a, there was a, a downtown uh, grant program that they used initially on Block 37. Um, all gone. Um, so we're on our own, and, yeah. and we're, we, we need a way to incentivize development in areas that we think need to be developed. And I, I will admit that there's two things. There's, there's the but for would it have would it have would Groupon have survived? But <laughs> yeah, they're going to move to Michigan. And, and right. that, that's mm -hmm. a valid point. And the slum and blighted thing is is LaSalle Street or Wacker Drive really slum right, and blighted? Right. Well, no. Yeah. But fact is, it's the only tool the city has. And you got to admit, uh, maybe thanks to our friend Ben Jarofsky and the Reader, who's been pounding away yeah. at this now for ten years, <laughs> um, the mayor has open the thing up so they're not, they're now uh, using uh, TIF proceeds to to build uh, schools mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they're they're starting to use it to do some affordable housing which is taking some of the heat off in terms of uh, mm -hmm. neighborhood groups and of course the irony is that by opening up the TIF budget the way the mayor has done in this in this latest budget announcement it it sort of parenthetically gives a whole bunch of money to the park district and to the schools because in order to get at the money that the mayor controlled, he had to release the money, if I'm understanding this correctly from talking to Ben Jarovsky, that the, the money that was locked up from the schools and from the parks then has to go back no, where it is came that from, right? right? Is that true? I, That's I the way I understand it. I, I think well, the schools no, I are think in the for city a little bit of a one time Yeah, I do too. I think the city still decides what schools and uh, what housing gets gets built in that the money the money does not bypass to the uh, the Go the, back to the, 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 the taxing district where yeah. the money was should initially the mayor paid. Let, should the mayor allow these districts to sunset when they <laughs> when the bonds, you know, when they run out to their 24? Yeah, he should, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, especially the uh, the yeah. ones that are not slum invited like downtown. <laughs> <laughs> like LaSalle Street. Astonishingly, we're down to our last minute. Really? So, would each of you like to give 30 seconds to give a personal address to the next mayor? Uh, what, what, are, what are the two or three things that the next mayor's got to look out for in his first couple of weeks in, or her first couple of weeks in office? Well, I'll, I'll repeat that you need to uh, have lunch with Ed Burke. Uh, and <laughs> because and he'll tell you what because you he's a, absolutely key, and he'll tell you what his needs are. The other thing is you've got to you've got to reach out because I mean uh, un unless we're going to have a black slash white Hispanic mayor, and I, it's uh -huh. going to be someone from one of the racial groups. Right. You've got to do what Rich Daly did, and which was really so the well. key to his administration is you've got to make you've got to be everybody's mayor. You got to reach You're out. Taking to my the, time, to John, the, to the factions. I think what you got to do is decide you're only going to be there for four years and do what has to be done, but make sure that your staff works with that city council, which was Rich, Rich Daly's real genius. I like that. That's a good. That's a good way to end. I want to thank you very much for watching. You've been watching Chicago Newsroom here on. It's a community service, of course, of Can TV. You can find us here on cable, but you can also see this and all the other programs on CanTV.blip.tv. Check us out there. Subscribe on iTunes. Everything else. Thank you, Dan Miller. Thank you, John McCarran. Hope you'll come back and be our Council of Elders many other times. And thank you for joining us here on Chicago Newsroom. I'm only 65.